Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a maid came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the porch, another maid saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you are also one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter was certain that Jesus would be able to overcome the evil forces that were opposing him. He had listened to Jesus declare what lay ahead with warnings about the cross that was coming and responded with, no, never, that cannot be. Peter was sure that Jesus had unlimited power and he felt that Jesus would use it against his enemies. Peter just couldn't bring himself around to believing that death was near at hand. The other disciples looked to Peter as an example of loyalty, strength, and devotion. He had been so near to Jesus in so many experiences. He was the first to declare that Jesus was the long-promised Messiah. Now, suddenly, he was thrust into an unforeseen situation. Before he realized what was happening, he had uttered words of denial, not just once, but three times. When he heard the rooster crow, the words of Jesus came back to him, and he realized the full implication of what he had done. This one who had been a symbol of strength and loyalty to his Lord had in just a few short hours become a witness to weakness and denial. How was it that Peter could use the same tongue to deny his Lord that he had earlier used to tell him of his devotion? In an effort to save his own skin, he had actually done the very thing that he had said he would never do. He was heartsick but he could not retract the words he had spoken. Do we sometimes fall short in this same way? Do we overpromise with our words and underdeliver with our actions? Do we stumble over the impulse to protect ourselves, even after pledging to stand with people who need us? That fateful night would soon give way to dawn and the beginning of a new day. With the soft rays of the early morning sun projecting a glimmer of light. But Peter did not see the light. He was surrounded by darkness. The darkness of denying a dear friend he had promised to protect with his life. And now his friend's life was heading toward the darkness of death. On the cross. Let us pray. Father, sometimes we have failed you when you needed a strong witness for your cause. Be merciful to us and forgive us for being lukewarm in our loyalty. Guide us that we may develop a rock-like faith within and express a stronger loyalty in all we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now at the feast, Pilate used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. Among the rebels in prison, there was a man called Barabbas a man who had committed murder in the insurrection. So the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them as was his custom. And he answered them, 
do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They cried out, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! Pilate washed his hands of him. He knew him to be innocent, but he delivered him to be crucified. Pilate, the world, the last human straw to which Jesus could cling, the final friend to whom he could turn, his last chance of appeal, and it is gone. Now only the way of sorrow lies before him, the heavy cross, the wailing women, the taunting multitude, the bitter wine, the thorns, the nails, now only the cross. What kind of crowd was it that asked for the release of Barabbas and the crucifixion of Jesus? What did they have against this teacher from Galilee? The people had been with Jesus in large numbers earlier in the week, coming from Bethany, entering the city, going up to the temple, but now their reaction was suddenly hostile. They had hailed him as their leader and had listened to his teaching. How could they suddenly turn against him and call for his death? There were two groups of people in the crowd outside Pilate's chamber. There were those who had been emotionally stirred up, perhaps even bribed, by some of the priests and the elders. These were the ones who shouted, Crucify him! But there was also a second group. This was the multitude that stood by and did nothing. Even though many of them believed that what was happening was wrong, they just went along with those who yelled the loudest. There were followers of Jesus in this group, but they let the mob spirit spread. And this mob spirit ultimately influenced Pilate in making his decisions. While we certainly condemn those who wanted Jesus crucified, we must also be critical of those who did not have the courage to stand up for their convictions. Public apathy is as wrong as public hysteria. Public opinion is important to persons in positions of power. And Christians have an obligation to stand up for matters of truth and issues of justice, especially where the rights of others are involved. Many people in the crowd got lost in the shadows of evil and trickery that morning. Before they realized it, they were swallowed up by the darkness of indifference and they said nothing to support their Lord. Do you join the crowd in shouting, Crucify him, as you take a, a stand which fails to stand with those who need your help? Do we crucify our Lord anew when we see injustice around us and do nothing? Are we willing to stand up for the convictions we hold dear, even if it means standing apart from the crowd and standing against what we know isn't right? Let us pray. Forgive us for our silence, Lord, and for failing to take a strong stand for you. Give us the courage we need to offer a faithful witness to you your church, and your truth by our words and with our deeds. In Jesus' name.
And the rulers derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ. And soldiers also mocked him, offering vinegar and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And many that passed by also reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and the Pharisees, said, He saved others, but he can't even save himself. He trusted God. Let God deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. One of the criminals hanged alongside of him kept deriding Jesus and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of death? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. As the two thieves were hanging on their crosses, they heard the voice of a third man there. They heard him pray for the forgiveness of those who were jeering at him, for those who hated him, for those who had nailed him there. They knew that their dying companion was not just a common criminal. Apparently, they realized that it was Jesus, the one who had claimed to be the Son of God. In spite of this, their attitudes toward Jesus and toward death were quite different. In fact, they represent two very different responses to suffering. The one thief had compassion as he was drawn near to Jesus through the suffering they were experiencing together, side by side. This one was humbled by Jesus' presence. The other was defiant to the very end. The only life force he knew was the power that might makes right. He was willing to believe in Jesus only if Jesus could show that he had the power to triumph over their enemies. In the end, he was concerned only about himself as he yelled, If you are the Christ, save yourself, and save us too. He met his death damned by his own bitterness. With the scorn of the unrepentant thief, the darkness increased around the cross. It was quite evident that while some persons would accept Jesus' message and follow his way, there would be those who would reject him and have nothing to do with his kind of kingdom. Each one of us has a cross to bear. For many, our cross is some sort of suffering we are forced to endure. How do you react to your cross? Does it bring you nearer to Jesus, since you know that he suffered too? Do you feel God's love building a bridge between God's presence and your needs? Or do we become bitter and turn our back on God? building barriers between our burdens and God's help. Which is it for you? Is God's love building bridges? Or are our feelings of bitterness building barriers? Let us pray. Father, speak to us in the difficult hours of life. Help us to lean on you as we face adversity, illness, or crisis, knowing that you will give us faith sufficient to meet every need. Uplift us as we carry our own crosses, assuring us that the burden will not be as heavy with your power and your strength undergirding us.
please click to the next recording and join us as we sing the hymn, O Sacred Head, Now Wound. 